Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody. There's a lot of you up there, so <laughs> it's nice to see so many, uh, so many faces out, uh, out there. It's great to see so many of you gathering with us online as well. We're glad that you are with us today. Thanks for coming out on this uh, beautiful Sunday in April, and uh, it is good to be here with all of you. We have a number of announcements. Today is the third Sunday of the month, and that means that we have our monthly Loaves and Fishes Plus Pantry. That uh, is tonight from 4 to 6 p.m. We, can have a drive, we have a drive through carry-out dinner available uh, to anyone that wants to come by and get that. And then we also, of course, have uh, our food pantry on site for anybody that uh, would like to take advantage of that. Um, volunteers and help is always appreciated for our Loaves and Fishes Plus Pantry. We continue to collect for Stowe Bulldog bags for the next few weeks. We are collecting juice boxes here at the church. You can bring those in. You can drop them off in a bin uh, here at the church. Uh, that is uh, greatly appreciative of your support there. The Wednesday evening grow group is going to meet, well, this Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. So I know it's right there in the title. <laughs> so uh, if you uh, want to be a part of that, you can just uh, click on the Zoom link that you'll find in your email inbox uh, in the next couple of days. So that's our Wednesday evening grow group via Zoom at 7 p.m. Please mark your calendars for Saturday, May 8th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. The trustees will be holding an all-church work day. Uh, there will be inside work. There will be outside work. There will be group work if you're comfortable with that. There will be individual work if that's something that uh, you want to do. So there will be something for everybody on, uh, on May 8th. Is it May 8th or May 1st? I think I got that date wrong. I think it's May 1st, actually. I think it's correct in your bulletin, so check that. <laughs> check that. Um, so you might want to re re check that out. Uh, please note that summer camps at Camp Christian are happening this summer. There will be junior camp, Cairo camp, CYF conference, and then there will be advanced conference as well. Adult conference is going to be happening also. That doesn't happen at Camp Christian, but it's going to be happening uh, online uh, this summer. So more information about that can be found at the Christian Church in Ohio website, or if you or have somebody you know that's interested in going to camp, uh, please let me know and we'll make that happen. And, and it can be noted that all of the Rumbergs are going to junior camp uh, this, this July. So AJ is getting to go to uh, his first time at Camp Christian, and uh, Violet gets to, to go back to camp. So we're all excited about that. And lastly, today is a special day in the life of the church because today we are going to finally be celebrating Kathy Gufson, who uh, has tried to retire from the church for the past, uh, I don't know, past couple of weeks now. Her official retirement date was March 31st, but, you know, we, we're like the godfather around here. Every time you try to get out, we just keep pulling you back in. So we might eventually let Kathy finally retire. Uh, we're not sure exactly when that is, but we do know that exactly today at 1130, we are going to be celebrating Kathy and her 25-year ministry here at First Christian Church. Uh, so we invite everyone to stick around following this time of worship. Those of you that are home, we hope that you will come and join us here at the church. We'll start that open house down in the lower lodge in the circle outside. Uh, we'll start that at 1130. There's going to be some light refreshments and, and a time to, uh, to greet Kathy and her family and to see your church family. And then around noon, we'll have, uh, we'll have a, sh a brief time of formalities. But, you know, when I say brief, you have to take that with a grain of salt because, well, I am a windbag preacher. So, But, you know, we'll, we'll get through this and uh, we will celebrate and honor and recognize Kathy and her family for her years and years of service. So we hope that you'll be a part of that today. Uh, as always, the bulletin is uh, online along with the sermon and the pastoral prayer. You can find that at the church website. Kiddos for today's children's sermon, you're going to need to bring with you a game, a game that you have at your house, a board game of some kind, or whatever game that you have. Have that uh, available for those of you that are here, have that in mind uh, for our children's sermon today. So that's what's happening in the life of the church. Check out more information online about how uh, you can be a part of what's going on. But now let us all be a part of what's happening here today, whether we are here or whether we are out there, we are together. So let us now focus on worshiping together and let us do that through our prayer.
Inspired by our text today from the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, Reverend Randy Kirk writes, We gather together in the name of the risen Lord. We gather together as sisters and brothers of the resurrected one. We gather together to share our faith and to worship God. We gather together because we have been made one in the spirit of Christ Jesus. We gather together to proclaim the good news of Easter. I appreciate that repetitive use of the words we gather together. For whether we gather together here in this space or we gather together from afar, we nonetheless gather together. Because as those who have been forgiven by our risen Lord and Savior, we have been drawn into the body of Christ Jesus. So no matter where we are, no matter the miles between us, we are gathered together into one body. So let us, as that one body, know that we have been gathered together and that we have been gathered together here to worship our God, our Creator, our Savior. So let us continue to do so, and let us do so as we sing together and worship the King. Good morning. Would you please pray with me? Father, thank you that you have brought each of us together today, wherever that may be. Quiet our minds and still our hearts as we invite your Holy Spirit to equip us, challenge us, comfort us, inspire us, and teach us. We ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. I'm sure there are many definitions of the word peace. Google's dictionary, just a quick Google search, um, defines peace as freedom from disturbance or state of tranquility. Sounds nice. This week was yet another that seemed so far away from free of disturbance or tranquil. And I must admit that my heart has been pretty heavy. 
I have a little sign in our bedroom that with its scripture from Psalm 46, I'm sure you all know it, be still and know that I am God. That little sign is enough to make me pause and remember that God is a refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. I read the rest of that psalm this week, and I was comforted and found some much-needed hope and peace. So I hope on your next rough day that perhaps you can pick up that, um, that scripture and, and take a little look at it. But in the meantime, please share the peace with one another this morning.
Chuck, Andrea, thank you so much. For, that was a beautiful, fun little piece you got going on there. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right, kiddos. You have your game that you, those of you that are at home have. How about those of you that are here? What game are you thinking about? Think of one? No? Jocelyn, shout it out. What's that? Tic tac toe. Okay. All right. Ava? Cards. Cards. Got to take the cards. Okay. All right. Candy Crush. Candy Crush. Chuck's got Candy Crush <laughs> on his phone. That's his game. All right. Well, that's good. That's good. Okay. Well, I brought a couple of games that my family loved. We, we play this one a lot. My boy AJ really likes Kids Create Absurdity. Yeah, they turned it into a game. Like, man, I could have invented that game years ago, right? <laughs> Some of you are thinking that. My kids created absurdity a long time ago. Now somebody's getting paid for that. You know, you should have thought of that, right? Here's another one, this Dragonwood, a game of dice and daring. This is a lot of fun that, uh, that we have. With. So these are just a couple of the games that my family has. And I wonder, you know, what you guys are thinking about, thinking about you know, the games that you have to play. And I wonder, you know, if we all brought, you know, games here to church today, if we would bring the same games. Probably not, right? I don't know. Does anybody have, have Dragonwood? You guys got Dragonwood? Awesome. No? You don't have that one? No? All right. That's okay, because there's all kinds of games out there, right? Do we all need to have all the same games? Well, of course not. In fact, that would be kind of hard if we all had all the games, right? Where would we put all of them, for instance, right? And of course, how would we pay for all those games? There's literally thousands and thousands of games out there. But here's the fun thing about all of this. Your family can have their favorite games to play, and my family can have our favorite games to play, and maybe now and then my family can share with your family the games that we love to play, and your family can share with my family the games that you guys love to play. If we do that, if we share our favorite games, then we don't have to own or store all of the games to enjoy them, right? Because we have other people in our lives who will share with us their favorite games, and we can share with them ours. This is what the early Christians were taught to do. The book of Acts tells us no one claimed private ownership over any possession, but everything they owned was held in common. So what do you think is good about this kind of sharing? Well, like I said, we don't have to try to pay and own all of the games, nor do we have to fill our house with so many games. We can enjoy and have fun with the games that we have, and then we can share them with others. And this works for all kinds of things, not just games. We can share all kinds of things. For instance, we can share the clothing that we outgrow with families who can use them, right? That way we don't spend a lot of money on clothing. We can keep sharing our clothes with others. And that's just one idea. Or we can share a part of our church's building to host, oh, I don't know, a community dinner or a food pantry or groups that are doing important work. That's what we're already doing, right? When we share what we have been blessed with, we are sharing our blessings. And that is what God always wants us to do, to share our blessings with others, be it games, be it a building, be it our resources, or whatever we have been blessed with. God always wants us to share those blessings with others. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for blessing us. Help us share those blessings with others. Amen. Thanks, everybody. We are living, breathing messages of God's love for the world. 
practicing what we teach, the words and worship here in church are beautiful and can continue that, we can continue that throughout the week. We are partners with God and with one another in this ministry. And our giving is one way that we practice what we teach, generosity and love. You can con continue to donate online at firstchristianstow.org or by mailing your offering into the church directly. For those in the room, there's a basket in the, in the back. <laughs> pray with me. Father, thank you that the, you are the light of the world, guiding our steps on your path. We now offer back to you a portion of what you have given us. May God the Father prepare our journey. Jesus the Son guide our footsteps and the Holy Spirit watch over us on every path that we follow. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. God's word for us today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. This is what I was just talking about in our children's sermon, talking about how believers are called to, to share. We read, Now the whole group who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership over any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great po power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Word, word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You've all heard of families being rescued from burning buildings, sailors being rescued at sea, cats being rescued from trees, dogs being called rescues when they are pulled out of abusive homes. But have you ever heard of food being rescued? Food is rescued when it is taken out of grocery stores, restaurants, gas stations, and hospitals before it goes into the trash. The food has not gone bad, but for a variety of reasons and regulations, they can't, the food can't be used or sold. Mike, you know all about those regulations about how and when you can use food. Unless it is rescued, it has to be thrown away. A new food resource movement has developed, and according to Fast Company magazine, this 
Pittsburgh-based nonprofit has become, quote, a crowdsourced transport network moving both food and people. Food Rescue will rescue food and deliver it to churches, community centers, senior centers, schools, even an entire neighborhood. Volunteers are notified of available food through a mobile app called Food Rescue Hero, and then quickly step into action, pick up the food, and deliver it to where it's needed. We have a great team, says Food Rescue leader Aaron Tolson. Together we are changing the food insecurity landscape here. We have been successful in reducing food waste and food insecurity because of the tremendous people involved. In just six months, one single food rescue branch delivered more than 200,000 pounds of food, which translates into over 100,000 meals. And the program is growing because donor locations, rescues, and downloads of the Food Rescue Hero app are increasing weekly. That's what happens when you mobilize a group of committed citizens and volunteers. No one person is the hero, but instead success comes through crowdsourcing, which is the practice of enlisting the help of a large number of people, typically via the internet, to get something done or shared. Around the country, Food Rescue Hero is making a positive difference by delivering food from, by diverting food from trash cans to hungry people. There are several of these locations in the greater Cleveland area that are doing this work. Over the course of five years, more than 12 million pounds of food has been rescued by over 100,000 volunteers. And its efforts have evolved. Now, in addition to delivering fresh food, food rescue heroes help transport those in need to get to their medical appointments. Technology is important, says Leah Lizarondo, one of the founders of the Food Hero Rescue Hero. But it's the power of collective action that will drive massive change. I love that statement because it's so true. It's the power of collective action that will drive massive change. What's true today was true in first century Jerusalem. The book of Acts tells us that the whole group of those who believe were of one heart and soul. And no one claimed private ownership over any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. A great team, tremendous people, instead of individual heroism, collective action. With great power, says Acts, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. As many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The result of this action was that there was no needy person among them. These Christians had been rescued by Jesus, so they wanted to rescue others. With great power, the apostles spoke then of the resurrection and of the good news of Jesus Christ. In all they did, they had one heart and one soul, and the power of their collective action drove massive change that still resonates today. It does take a group. It does take a group for us to all get something done. And maybe it would take a little group for somebody to help AJ get settled into his seat a little bit. So his mother and his sister are away on a Girl Scout weekend. And he's left with his old man <coughs> who's had to work a bit this weekend. I had to do a funeral yesterday and so AJ has been, buddy, you can just 
sit there. Thanks, buddy. I know, it's hard. I know. <laughs> Hang in there. He's doing so good. And all they did, they had one heart and one soul, and the power of the collective action drove massage, massive change that still resonates today. And if the church is going to feed the hungry, assist the poor, and share the good news of Jesus, we need to tap into this mindset, this approach to being church, the power of the Spirit to drive massive change. Such an approach is foundational to our faith and well within our abilities. We need Christians focusing on ordinary Christianity, writes Pastor Tony Merida. This means speaking up for those whose voices have been silenced, caring for the single mom, restoring the broken, bearing burdens, welcoming the functionally fatherless, and speaking the good news to people on a regular basis in order to change the world. Marita is right to say that ordinary Christianity is the most important kind of Christianity. Start with the great commandment, he says. Love your neighbor as yourself. Reach out to those in need. Feed the hungry. Shelter the homeless. Visit the prisoner. Speak good news to people around you. This was the ordinary Christianity being practiced by the first followers of Jesus. Not isolated heroes, but as members of a broader, unified community. They were ordinary Christians who crowdsourced their abilities and their assets and then tackled their challenges through collective action. Now this isn't some deep theological revelation you needed a pastor to tell all of you. We all know the quote from Margaret Mead who said, never doubt the small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. What is needed, though, is not a reminder of this biblical model, but a modern day example that can help us begin to envision how we can drive massive change today. Christian activist and author Shane Claiborne has written a book called The Irresistible Revolution, Living as an Ordinary Radical. And there's that word, ordinary, again. Ordinary radical, ordinary Christian. In the book, he tells the story of two college buddies who told him that they were going to go to Philadelphia to hang out with their, quote, homeless friends and asked Claiborne if he wanted to come along, which he agreed to do. Claiborne admits at first he was afraid he would be robbed. But in the end, he tells how the people in the alleys, quote, stole only my heart. In his book, Claiborne tells how a group of 40 homeless families who were about to be evicted from the abandoned cathedral in North Philadelphia they were living in, gave him a perspective and a vision for living out this biblical model for massive change. He joined a group that went to help these families, a group that would evolve and become a club, a club that they called Youth Against Complacency and Homelessness Today, or for short, Yacht Club. Their Yacht Club was not for boaters, but sometimes boaters would call them looking for membership information. Claiborne and his, his friends would explain who they actually were and the work that they did. And then they would ask for a donation. <laughs> Claiborne and his club saw a need. Shelter for homeless families. They responded through their yacht club. An ordinary crowdsourced Christian effort. Their work became so successful and important that Claiborne and others from the club moved into a small roadhouse in underserved section of Philadelphia. 
Their vision was to love God, love people, and follow Jesus. They began calling their little effort the simple way. Since then, they have shared food with folks who needed it. They've run a community store out of their house. They have reclaimed abandoned lots and planted gardens in the concrete jungle. They have rehabbed abandoned houses and made friends with people in prison and on death row. Claiborne and his club have seen a vision of another way to live, the way of ordinary Christians. It is formed by and directed toward changing the world for the better. The Christians of Jerusalem had been rescued by Jesus. And because they were, they wanted to rescue others. They gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and they shared their resources with such generosity that there was not a needy person among them. In chapter 9 of the book of Acts, the writer names this effort, calling it the way. These ordinary, radical for the time Christians became part of a movement which took their lives in a new direction and it had world changing impacts. In his book, Claiborne writes No wonder the early Christian church was known as the way. It was a way of life that stood in glaring contrast to the world. Of course, everyone was forewarned that in this kingdom, everything is backward and upside down. The last are first, and the first are last. The poor are blessed, and the mighty are cast from their thrones. The Christian way still stands in contrast to the world. Instead of me first, it's us first. Instead of hate your enemy, it is love your enemies. Instead of store up your treasures on earth, it is store up your treasures in heaven. Claiborne's story begins to show us how we can implement and further this ordinary Christian way today. No, we don't have to move to inner city Philadelphia to meet a need, but we do have to see a deep need and then take collective action because the work of rescuing, be it the homeless, the abandoned, the hungry, the marginalized, well, that takes on many forms. But su successful rescue is always best accomplished by a group. So we can show up as a group at a city council meeting and speak in favor of affordable housing. We can show up at a school board meeting and speak in favor of racial diversity, equity, and inclusivity. We can join a group that offers after-school tutoring for children at risk. We can take food and seasonal clothing to Tent City in Akron. We can help at our own loaves and fishes plus pantry each month. It is the power of ordinary Christians taking collective action that will drive massive change. In the ordinary Christianity of first century Jer Jerusalem, Christians worked together to help those in need. Rather than being the church that was split into liberals and conservatives and all the titles and labels that we put on ourselves today, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Possessions were not hoarded, but instead everything that was owned was held in common. Rather than the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, there was not a needy person among them because they pooled their resources and distributed aid to each as they had need. We are still part of this movement, this ordinary Christian way, a way that takes our lives in a new direction. Having been rescued by Jesus and being given new life through his resurrection, we can see a need, meet a need, and then change the world. And like the Christians of Jerusalem, we do this best when we work together 
and practice ordinary Christianity. Amen. Friends, let us join together and go to God through our prayers. Let us pray. God of the resurrection, we gather this morning as a community of believers. We come with joy to greet one another and to tell again and again the amazing news. Christ is risen. Love is victorious over death. You have given us new life, a new life that is set within the one body of Jesus Christ who draws us together so that together with him and through him we can change the world for the better. Holy God, it is always our desire to be part of this movement to help change the world for the better. We have heard your call and nothing about it ever repels us, for we know of its incredible power and amazing grace. But at times, reluctance invades our minds, which often trickles down into our hearts. Often we hide true intentions behind stubborn silence, or an attitude that we are too few, and the need is too vast. So we admit that our motives are at times displeasing to you, who knows us better than we know ourselves. We pray you then cultivate the power of Jesus in us so that we would discern where and when and how you send us to do your will. Instill in us the sense of community Jesus sought to share through his life and deeds. Help us to grasp its essence more clearly, weaving within our spirits the power you gave to the early church that is the same power you give today's church power that can make the impossible possible, the ordinary extraordinary. Holy God, we know you love us, and we know you send us out into the world to share the good news of Christ's love. So speak to us again your words of forgiveness and grace, while reminding us again that you have gathered us together to be a community of believers who believe that together with your Holy Spirit, we can truly change the world for the better. You hear now the prayers of our hearts as we share them in this time of holy silence. we pray in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive them our debts. And lead us not in temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us gather together around our Lord's table. And let us come together around it as we sing together our communion hymn.
we gather together around this table, we gather around a table that is set with simplicity, with the simpleness of a loaf of bread and a cup. And Jesus was very intentional to use these elements because they were quite common for the day. They were common that anyone could come across these elements. And they are common for that reason so that all can come to this table. All who desire, all who hear the invitation and respond by coming to the table. For you come to this table just as you are, not because you are something in particular. You come because you have heard the invitation to Jesus to come and to gather. And here at this table with these simple elements, that is when the power and transformation and change occurs. For it is in these simple elements that Jesus reminds us of grace and forgiveness and unconditional love, all of which change us for the better. And they make us ready to go forth to share that change with others. So let all hear that invitation from Jesus to come and gather around this table to partake of these simple elements and have them change them for the better again. It was on that night when Jesus gathered with his disciples and the night before he was to be crucified. He gathered with them and he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, Take and eat of this, all of you. For this bread represents my broken body, broken for you. Take and eat of it and do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, Jesus took a cup and he gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take and drink from this, all of you. For this cup represents my shed blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Friends, let us come to this table. Receive these gifts. For they are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Thank you, Father that you have promised to hear our prayers and petitions and to nourish us with the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us to prepare our hearts as we partake in grateful remembrance. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Jesus is always inviting us, inviting us to draw closer to him and draw closer to that life-changing power that is within him. So let us all, again, hear and consider that invitation, and let us do so now as we sing together our hymn of invitation, the first and third verses of Leaning on the Everlasting. Let us sing. Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace. 
face with my Lord's veneer, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. We do lean on the everlasting arms of Christ our Savior. So let us go forth knowing that we always have those arms to lean on, especially when we are working for change. Let us go forth though ready to be part of that change that Christ is always at work to make happen in our world. Let us go forth ready to share that good news, knowing that it can change everything. And so as you go forth to share in it, may the grace of God, the constant and abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, and the unconditional love of Jesus Christ rest and abide with each and every one of you, now and forevermore. Amen. Oh, how sweet to walk in this filled way.